But I used to sell equipment like IBM and NCR at one point. I, I actually owned companies and, and, uh, and uh, ran marketing campaigns. And I can tell you that branding is extremely important. And we must learn it fast. Unless we can actually brand, the key is to have our own brand and to, and to advocate our brand more strongly than these guys are peddling their, their brand. Marketing is extremely important, how they actually market these ideas. We must study how to do this. You know, some of the values of humility and, and, uh, and the lack of showmanship, which were part of the traditional uh, uh, outlook, have become our worst enemies in many ways. Because, because of that humility, the shiuch are not talking. And we're, they're not branding. And they're not showing. And that's how we're losing the battle to these brand vendors who are very good at it. A second interesting thing related to branding is franchising which is a, an amazing way of growing businesses, but it's also an amazing way of growing terrorist organizations. Many of these guys have actually made a kit ready to establish a franchise anywhere, complete with flags, logos, messaging, organizational structure, uh, secret ways of communicating, encrypted techniques, including using encryption in video games, for example. Okay. So by giving a package, Anybody can become ISIS because they can very simply take their franchise. How does franchising work and how can you stop it? And how can we do reverse franchising, meaning how can we franchise the values that we believe in? How can you franchise compassion and kindness and love and humility and respect? How can we, how can we do that? How can we set up organizations that can replicate goodness? just as they are replicating this evil. Okay? So we need to take a look at that as well. Now, regarding the enemies of, of Islam and the enemies of, of, of our nations, there are multitude. But the biggest enemy we have is our own self, I must tell you. And I think that if Muslims are to make any progress, we have to stop blaming others and, and accusing them of conspiracies. There may be conspiracies, but we are playing into their hands because we are failing to inoculate our, our, our children against these, these movements. So let us, rather than focus on what others are doing to us, focus on, on ourselves. What are we doing to preserve that, is, that, that which is good in our culture, that is which is good in our, in our civilization. So what is next is not a fatalistic question. It is not like, what will they do to us next? It's what are we going to do next? What's our vision for the future? If we have no vision, we can have no strategy. If we have no strategy, we can have no tactics. If we may have no tactics, we make no progress. We'll be defeated. And we need to somehow articulate this. And our vision must not be invented by ourselves. Our vision must be a kind of re-articulated vision of our forefathers who have an authentic tradition. And there is a vision, a vision that is, speaks of sa'adatayn, to happiness. You know, now the measurement of happiness and the criterion of happiness has become so popular in some countries they've made a minister of happiness. <laughs> Islam has double happiness. Happiness in dunya and happiness in akhirah. And the beautiful thing about it is that it does not tell you that in order not to have the second one, you must be miserable in the first. It tells you be happy in the first and be happy in the second. But how? <coughs> How? And, and it actually teaches you how, and it tries to... So, if you notice something, go to any, the poorest village in Malaysia, and go to, in front of the little mosque, or the shop where the, where the elderly meet for in the evening to talk, okay? Or in the early morning to talk after fashion. And look at them. They have the most beautiful smiles. Radiant, and light, and, 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 and content. And you come to the big city and you look at the business district and these people are walking very angry, you know? With gray faces, no light, you know? Why? It's because those guys have happiness-giving values that have been properly transmitted and not mutilated. Let us do a study on what makes Malay people happy. Historically, what does contentment mean? This is sociological research that's of the utmost importance. And how can we increase this content? Because one of the interesting phenomena about ISIS and, and related movements is that they actually live off anger. 
they live off grievances. Because, I don't know if you've ever had this phenomenon in schoolyards, you know? When I was a kid, some kids used to do this, and it's very bad. They would, they would, they would find a grievance. So, for example, one kid happened to push you, you know? And you forget about it. So the other kid comes and says, you know, he pushed you. You know, you know what this means, he insults you. You're not mad enough, you know? He pushed you around, and you begin to boil, you become angry. And you know, you have every right to punch him in the nose. The sense of grievance gives you a self-righteousness, which then gives you the justification to inflict violence against the other. Most of these movements usually begin, for example, their videos for recruiting begin with grievances. Muslims being burned in, in this country, Muslims being bombed in this other country, Muslims being enslaved in this third country. They begin with, they fill you up with grievances, so you're very angry. And now that you have all this grievance, you're self-righteous. You feel justified in inflicting similar things. They fail to tell you that just because this person oppressed that person, that you have no right to blow up somebody in the airport in, in Brussels. They, 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 they never make that distinction. They kind of use the grievances in one area to justify any action in any other area. They kind of universalize the self-righteousness and the, and the sense of grievances and the license to do violence. And, and we need to get over this. Islam is not about the redress of grievances through revenge. It is actually about, yes, justice, yes, but forgiveness immediately after. Because you cannot forgive if you don't have the right of a judgment. So that if you are grieved, you go to the judge. You don't just take the revenge yourself. And once the judge gives you the right, you are asked by Islam to forgive. This combination of compassion and justice, we, we, we dump half of it and we just keep the justice by itself. Justice by itself is very dangerous. Very dangerous. Justice only makes sense in a framework of compassion and forgiveness. It has to be complemented by other things, which our tradition teaches. Forgive me, you know, because I've been so busy with the politics and the embassy, I have a chance to talk now and it's all, you know. <laughs> Abu Hush by Abu Bakr Nadi. The street text is very popular among the jihadis in the Middle East. So, number one is what makes them so popular among these jihadis? Number two, if we use this, our discourse, the, the Kalam discourse, or the epistemological framework to analyze these street texts, what is wrong with that? They tell you, here are the proper teachers who will show you the way. And they usually give you a canon, what's called the canon. A canon is a, a set of authorized writers or figures or teachers. You are precluded from reading anything else. And you read these usually short texts, day and night, and videos and, 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 uh, and, and uh, tapes and so on, until you are filled with the ideas of these very limited number of figures. These guys do not like Tabaqat al-Shafi'iyya, you know, multi-volume works. They like little pamphlets, you know. Just like the revolutionaries of Marxism at one point and the revolutionaries in Europe and the communes of Paris and so on did. It's pamph pamphleteering, you know. Once you have an isolated person being indoctrin indoctrinated day and night by a very limited, narrow canon of authorized figures, okay, they become now ready. Soldiers ready for instructions. How do you make them ready for instructions? The same way Mussolini did, with the doctrine of obedience. Mussolini actually wrote a, a whole section of his book is on obedience. Okay? Ta. And they linked in Islamic, you, they use the words that are associated in Islam with ta'a, like bay'a. The bay'a ala ta'a. You know? And then once you have this readiness to obey, that's it, you're programmable. They just give you a set of instructions, no issues. And finally, they actually tell you 
that you don't even have to deal with your ordeal for long. Why should you actually worry about it in dunya and work hard and do this and that? Why don't take the expressway to Jannah, you know? And that's how they make sure people suicidal. It's because they, there is something which is called the death wish in psychoanalysis. They actually discover your death wish and they build on it to make you wish to die, you know? <coughs> and to make that death wish a glorious thing. And that's how they, they manufacture these monsters. So all these three books are already there in, in Ma'alim fi tariq And all these books are already there in some of the writings of Maududi, not all of it, but some of it. And all of these books are actually foreign to Islam. They actually come from Lenin. I read Lenin and you'll see that it's exactly the same structure. They actually come from Mussolini. Because these guys in the 1920s, even the time of Aqqad, and, and, and they were very impressed by Carlyle and some of these British fascists and some of these uh, Italian fascists. The 1920s and 30s are really important to study and re-study and re-study. Because I think much evil has come from that period. If I may just add one thing which is, I think, extremely important. Imam Ghazali, rahmatullah Ali, who's a great Imam of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah and of, of this great nation. This nation is Ghazalian and should celebrate always Imam Ghazali. Imam Ghazali has book, the Kitab al ihya four quarters. And he has a rub'ah which is called Rub'ah al muhlikat and a rub'ah which is called Rub'ah al munjiyat There is a, a section on what saves you and a section on what destroys you. The amazing thing about ISIS and like-minded uh, people is that they take the Rub'a al-Muhlikat and they actually make it into Munjiyat. So, istikbar or ghurur becomes a virtue. They call it Issa, you know? Hasad and envy of other communities and other people, they actually justify it because they're so pure and everybody else is not so pure. As a matter of fact, even their personal sins become transformed. And it's an interesting phenomenon that many criminals become recruits for ISIS very quickly. Criminals as in murderers, rapists, thieves. Why? Because think about it. If you were a wretched murderer, rape, committer, thief, you're totally worthless. And you're in jail. And somebody comes to you, to you and tells you, you know, that killing that you're being punished for, that's jihad. And that rape that you just committed, you can do that all the time. You can just go, go and, and uh, uh, actually own women by going into a village and taking all these women for yourself. And that thieving, that's just ghanima. So they actually give you the ability to transform your dhunu into virtues. Your sin becomes virtuous, just like this. Who wouldn't go for it? It's, a, it's an amazingly magical recruitment technique. And it's not something we should go at. That is why in, in prisons, two things must happen. Our shiuch and ulama and so on must not forget the doctrine of tawbah, which is extremely important. To actually give people a, a way to escape their sin without having to go this way. We must not forget the doctrine of shafa'a, which is part of the aqidah of al-sunnah al-jama'ah. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shafi'ak and that there is a way for you out. Because if you don't give people a way to redeem their, their sins in a, in a healthy way, they will find a cheap way to redeem their sins by transforming them into what they think is our virtues. So the psychology of redemption is extremely important. In the prisons, as you have programs for reform, do not throw these people like they are dogs and leave them with more criminal elements who will transform them into even more vicious people. But actually try to work to give them a way out of that psychology of entrapment. That's extremely important. Uh, I don't understand the question. The, the, the environment, the psyche of the people, the youngsters, the doctrine that's dominated the popular thinking, that, that, that makes that, uh, once the spring happens, that people are easily following them. And it was very similar to the Maoist uh, cultural revolution. He actually systematically shut down all the uh, kulliyat that used to teach religion, including the University of Imam Muhammad bin Ali Sunusi in Beida, and all the ma'ahid that uh, branched from it. 
he also uh, uh, actually supported book burning, so what he called yellow books at the time. I was just a child then, and I remember those uh, those uh, that, that those claims about yellow books you know, that were uh, somehow retarded and somehow um, counter-revolutionary. So they they got destroyed. He also made sure that he systematically uh, eliminated all the great youth that used to have a following in society. And then began to preach his own Green Book and his own outlook and so on. As he pushed his uh, revolutionary discourse, the traditional discourse of Islam almost disappeared. No more teaching, no more madrasas, no more. And he, he continued to push his, he actually used divisiveness between the tribes and the people and the classes and the and then nationalization of private property where the poor took the property of the rich and so on. So by the time 14 years of that, the ground was already quite set, quite desolate. There was a lot of anger at oppression and it outburst in the spring. But the feelings of negativity so spontaneously rose, but it was not clear what values we wanted and what, what values we, 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 we want to live by and how we are going to instill these values. So while we wrote these documents and, and talked about freedom and human rights and so on, I don't think it sank very deep. And the evidence is there is more human rights abuse after the revolution than before the revolution. So the tyranny was destroyed. The security system was destroyed, but the values were not there to, 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 to be replenished, to be re-articulated. There have been people who have been working hard to do that, but it's really working really uh, uh, at, a, at a very difficult situation. Because not only is it desolate, but also because as soon as the revolution succeeded, there were some revolutionaries who were professional, who had party apparatus, command and control, they knew exactly what they were doing, well funded, and they quickly took hold of the joints of the state. And that's why as the Arab uprising happened and the Arab Spring was going up, a big machine came and, and cut out the, the spring. And that machine basically is ideological, uh, is an ideological machine of, of tiny groups in terms of population. They lost all the elections, three elections they lost. But somehow they managed to control the nodes of the state. And when they lost the last election, they went and grabbed the capital, Tripoli, and set themselves up in a pseudo-government. And we've been having a protracted one year and a half uh, of, of negotiation in order to create some sort of a unity government, which is trying to get into Tripoli as we speak. So, inshallah, we hope that that will happen. But it's a very difficult situation. So, I urge you... Do not have a cultural revolution of that kind. <laughs> and do not let such a revolution be imposed upon you by movements that come from the Arab world that, 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 is, that is disrespectful of your tradition. We've had young kids who go overseas and come back and they call their father kafir and they call the imam in their mosque kafir because they happen to be Sufi or because they happen to follow the tradition of the country. So uh, you should not allow this phenomena to, to arise. And I'm not saying just clap, clap down on it security-wise, sometimes you have to do that, but you really need to spend massively. And when I say spend, like money and energy and effort and media attention to make sure that you do not lose your new generation. On our website, kalamresearch.com, uh, you can download some PDFs on, on some of what I said. And uh, we're very happy to correspond with you to hold future events, workshops, seminars. If you'd like to come and visit me in the United Arab Emirates, uh, because Dubai is a hub for most of you when you travel to Europe or other places, stop by and we can continue the discussion, inshallah. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Speaker malam ini bercakap tentang uh, peranan diskos atau peranan diskos ilmu wacana ilmu yang menjadi asas kepada timbulnya uh, itu, uh, pergolakan yang sedang berlaku di Timur Tengah ini dan dia cuba mengaitkan dengan sejarah-sejarah yang berlaku sebelum pada Perang Dunia Kedua 
uh, berlaku semasa Perang uh, Dunia Pertama dan uh, buku-buku rujukan yang menjadi buku penting pada masa itu juga uh, disebut oleh oleh pencerah, apa ni, juru, apa ni, penceramah kita malam ini jadi, dan cuba mengaitkan dengan apa yang berlaku sekarang ini dalam konteks ISIS jadi ulasannya sangat menarik dan kita dapat uh, pengalaman ataupun pandangan yang apa, first hand eh, first hand experience daripada uh, yang benar-benar terlibat eh, ataupun uh, yang berasal daripada negara yang terlibat dengan uh, IS ni dan juga uh, yang apa ni yang bukan saja terlibat tetapi juga uh, seorang profesor dan juga uh, seorang uh, apa ni uh, pemimpin pemimpin negara